Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome back to Health and Fasting. This is a series of shows where we'll be talking about the effects of Ramadan on your health and how that may impact you and your ability to carry out the fasts. In the last episode, we talked a bit about the digestive system. How does the digestive system work and how is that important for us in terms of when we're fasting? So we talked about the processes of digestion, starting from when we're eating, chewing the food, and then the food enters the stomach, and then enters the small intestine, and then transmit through the bowel to eventually be excreted. And this, we said, this process takes a period of about two days, from when we eat something to that food then being excreted. So we talked about that and how that may impact us in fasting, and some of the reasons why that's important for us to be aware of why that works and how it works, and how that is important for us in, in terms of fasting. In this episode, we're going to go into a bit more detail about the physiological changes that occur during fasting. So what I mean by that is, what are the changes in the body in terms of how does the body work when you are in the period of fasting, and why is that important for us to know, and how may that affect what we do when we're fasting. So during the normal process of eating, what happens is, when the food is absorbed into the stomach, it starts, the body starts taking nutrients from the food that is being eaten and absorbed at that moment. However, if we enter a period of fasting, some changes will occur that will then mean the body takes its nutrients from somewhere else. So when we say fasting, in terms of the medical definition of fasting, the body enters a period of fasting after about eight hours. So if we have eaten before eight hours, then we will not enter the state of what is known as fasting in terms of a physiological sense. So there must be at least a period of eight hours before the body enters the state of fasting. So after eight hours, what happens is the body is no longer absorbing nutrients from the food that has been consumed in the eight hours prior. It then starts to utilize the stores that are within the body. So stores within the body are primarily in the liver and these are what is then metabolized by the body and broken down. As well as utilizing nutrients and pr primarily glucose from the liver, the body also starts to use glucose and nutrients from the muscle. So the liver and muscle are the, now the sources of providing nutrition to the body after a period of eight hours has elapsed. So the body is now using glucose from the muscles and the liver. After this time, when this has been used up, then the body will also start to break down fat. Now this can be very beneficial for us in terms of trying to help us if we were planning to lose weight or become more healthy. So when after a period of eight hours, the body is no longer absorbing nutrition from the food that we've eaten, it starts to use the stores from the liver and the muscle, and these are then provided to, used to provide nutrition to the body. Once this process has stopped, then the body will start to turn to break down fat. So this can be really very useful for us if we are thinking about wanting to lose weight or become more healthy. But it also depends on the type of food that we eat, which we'll be discussing shortly and in subsequent episodes as well. Now if this process continues and we still don't eat, then eventually the body will start to break down protein stores. Now this is not healthy. This is what we call the period of starvation. And we've seen pictures of images of people in other parts of the world who are starv starving and they look very emaciated, very thin, they have muscle wasting, they look like they're undernourished. So this is not a healthy state. And this is something that would occur after a prolonged period of several days or weeks of continuous fasting. However, obviously during the holy month of Ramadan, we have two opportunities where we break the fast, at Suhur and Iftar. So the likelihood of us entering the starvation mode is very, very small because we have the opportunity at dawn and dusk to break the fast and prevent the body going into what we call starvation mode where it's actually breaking down essential proteins and essential constituents of the body. So during this process of this fasting over 30 days, 
whilst we're eating at dawn and dusk. During the period of fasting, the body is utilizing stores that it has that may be in excess. So this is a really useful way for us to think about losing weight and becoming more healthy. Now, we also need to think about what we eat because it is possible, sounds strange, but it is actually possible for us to put on weight during Ramadan and actually become overweight if we're not careful and we don't consider what we're eating. So this is an important point to think about. Most people think that if you're not eating, you will actually lose weight. This isn't the case in most of the instances, but it is important to consider the foods that we're eating so that we don't go the other way and actually end up putting on weight instead of losing weight if we're trying to become more healthy. So during the fast, we have a gradual transition from using glucose from the food that has been eaten, then stores from the liver and the muscle, and then we start to break down fat. So this is a really gentle transition in terms of us utilizing the energy stores that we have within our body, helping us to become more healthy and have a better sense of well-being. Also, after a period of fasting, the body will start to produce these hormones known as endorphins. These are what are known as the feel-good hormones. So sometimes when we are in a period of exercise or running, these hormones are also produced and they are the hormones that make us feel energetic, they make us feel refreshed. And these same hormones are starting to be produced by the body once we enter this period of fasting where we're breaking down some of the stores in our body. So not only are we becoming more healthy in terms of our physical well-being, we also feel better, we feel enlightened, we feel refreshed from a mental perspective. So it sounds strange, but again, the period of fasting actually increases and heightens mental awareness and mental well-being, which are both very important for us to be aware of because the human body is not just physical. The human body has spiritual and mental aspects as well, and fasting can be very beneficial for the mental side of our well-being, which is something that we really need to consider and think about how we can improve those aspects of our overall health. So it's also important to think about our fluid intake and the kidneys are the organs that are involved in maintaining fluid balance. So the kidneys will be maintaining the balance of fluid and they will be absorbing the nutrients from the fluid that we have drunk and then obviously excreting all the waste when we pass urine. So it's very important for us to be aware of our fluid balance and our salt intake during the period of fasting because if this becomes disarranged, then we may go into dehydration and have problems that mean that we have to stop fasting because we have become unwell due to becoming dehydrated. So it's very important for us to think about the fluids that we drink and make sure that we keep ourselves well hydrated whilst we are fasting. So the kidney is a vital organ in terms of maintaining our fluid balance. And during Ramadan, especially when the fast are long in the summer as they are in the UK, we may end up not drinking enough. So this may cause a number of issues for us. First of all, as we've discussed, the problem of possibly becoming dehydrated. Secondly, it may lead to some people developing urinary tract infections. So what this means is you get an infection in your bladder and then you get ba pain, burning, stinging when you're passing urine and you may feel unwell in yourself. You may have fever, temperature, you may also have abdominal pain and sometimes you may have pain in the kidneys around the side uh, of what we call the flank area. <clears throat> so this is something to be aware of that we must try and maintain a good fluid balance and make sure that when we break the fast and open the fast that we also drink enough as well as eating because we want to make sure that we're not getting dehydrated or putting ourselves at risk of developing urinary tract infections. Also another problem that some people sometimes develop is what is called kidney stones. So these are small stones which are normally made of a substance called calcium and they become lodged in the uh, urinary system somewhere. And this may cause severe pain around the side, it may cause blood in the urine, it may make you feel very unwell, and you may end up having to be admitted to hospital for treatment with IV fluids and sometimes for actual treatment of dealing with the stone itself. So keeping yourself well hydrated is a very important thing for us to remember. So we try and prevent the problems with dehydration, urinary tract infections, and also kidney stones. So if you do feel unwell during the fast, if particularly with these symptoms, you feel that you're not hydrated enough, or you have pain when you're passing urine, or you notice blood in the urine, particularly blood in the urine, which may be either with an infection or a stone, or you have pain around the side where we've described already, 
any of these mean that you should A, break the fast and B, go and see your doctor as soon as possible. So they can easily, when you see your doctor, your GP, they can dipstick the urine, they check, check the urine with a little stick, which will show whether there's infection and show whether there's any blood. And they will be able to treat you with, if necessary, antibiotics. Or if you have a stone, they'll advise you to drink lots of fluids. And if, unfortunately, if it's very bad, you may need to be admitted to hospital. But it is important to remember that when you, if you feel unwell, with these symptoms of burning, stinging, discomfort when you're passing urine, blood in the urine, <coughs> or abdominal pain, that you must break your fast and try and see your doctor as soon as possible. In, in another subsequent episode, we're going to be talking about the kind of food that is useful for us to eat and the kind of food that we should avoid. But just very briefly, just so that we have an idea of the things that are helpful for us to eat and things that might be detrimental, it's important to just touch on that now. So in the UK, the majority of Muslims are from the Asian continent, India, Pakistan. And we, we love our food, there's no doubt about that. We love our snacks, we love our curries, and we love to eat well. And I know that, and I'm, I'm one of those people myself, I love my food, but it's important for us to think during the period of fasting, what is useful for us to eat and what we should avoid. So we need to try and consume what are called complex carbohydrates. So foods that will release their energy over a longer period of time, so that they sustain us through the period of fasting, rather than eating foods that are high energy released quickly. So these, for example, things that we should avoid are fried snacks like samosa, pakora, bhajias, uh, onion pajis, these type of things. These are very nice, but they are generally best avoided or eaten in moderation and in addition to a longer sustaining meal with complex carbohydrates such as uh, bread, which is brown bread, uh, potatoes, these type of things, pulses, lentils, these will be much more useful for us to consume in the fast that will sustain us during the long period of fasting. Also, it's useful to think about how we prepare and cook our food. So these high energy foods that are released quickly are generally fried and they're generally deep fried. So again, this is very unhealthy for us generally, but particularly in the holy month of Ramadan, it's not a good idea for us to eat foods that are deep fried because they provide the energy very quickly and it's not sustaining for us through the period of fasting. So what we can do perhaps instead of deep frying something is if we do wish to have these snacks, try to shallow fry them. So in a very small amount of oil, just on the base of the pan rather than immersing them in a wok or a big deep pan where they're deep fried. So that's a useful thing to think about. Also, instead of frying, it might be worth grilling. So if we're having uh, fish, instead of frying the fish, we grill the fish and there'll be very little difference in the taste. In fact, what you will find is that the taste of the food is enhanced by grilling because you're not covering it in oil and making it deep fried. So grilling the food instead of frying is also a very useful tip that we might be able to use during fasting. And if we're able to continue that after the period of fasting to maintain a healthier lifestyle and well-balanced nutrition, thinking about grilling food rather than frying it. Also in terms of when we make our curries, often they are very heavily cooked in a lot of oil. And this doesn't really enhance the taste, but people believe, they have the false belief that using more oil in your food makes it more tasty. There is no evidence for this. Actually, the taste comes from the spices and the herbs that we add, and these are what add the taste to the food. So what we could do is, before Ramadan, is try decreasing the amount of oil that you use slowly. So instead of just pouring the oil in, measure it with a tablespoon. So say you use five tablespoons of oil in your curry, then over the preceding three, four weeks before the holy month of Ramadan, take it down to four tablespoons, and then maybe three tablespoons, and then two tablespoons, and see if you notice any difference in the taste. And I think that oh, you'll find there'll be no difference in the taste. However, the food will be much more healthy, and it will give you much more energy, rather than giving you a lot of unnecessary fats. So these are some of the things that we're going to be discussing in the subsequent episode. But I hope that some of these tips and tricks in terms of how the body works, the physiology of fasting, and foods that we need to think about will be helpful for us in containing, continuing and maintaining a successful and happy Ramadan. I look forward to seeing you again in a subsequent episode of Health and Fasting. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.